In my previous lecture, I had in the title announced uh, some more than I, than I did, at least uh, part of the edition I want to briefly touch upon. Um, and this is again uh, a very politically sensitive, if not to say dangerous subject that um, I want to bring up. Um, again, I must say, I dare to bring that up in my classes <laughs> at my university also. Um, and about that stuff, I have not yet received any complaints. Um, this is a table that is culled from uh, a recently published book by Richard Lynn and Tatu Fanhanen, um, who did some very simple and elementary investigation. Um, and uh, what they did was uh, try to show does there or does there not exist some sort of correlation between IQ and uh, some economic output measure such as GNP. I should say from the outset um, that they did not just <coughs> use one IQ measure for countries, they typically had, for most of the countries, several types of IQ measures available and uh, showed first that they are all highly intercorrelated, uh, so to speak, uh, uh, convincing us that we can uh, put a certain amount of trust into the numbers that they use. And they also did not just use one economic output measure, just, just as GNP, but also if, if it was available two or three, and again intercorrelated them and uh, tried to show that there was uh, a high internal consistency um, among the numbers. Um, now, the uh, correlation that they established, um, I'll say immediately something about the interpretation of this table, um, is extremely high for social sciences. Um, that is uh, close to 0 0.7, um, which is if you have ever done empirical research in sociology or psychology or so, uh, those, those are numbers that are mind-bogglingly high. Um, I mean, people are usually impressed already if you have correlations of 0.2 or 0.3 or something like that. That is already considered to be uh, worth showing. Uh, so here we get very high correlations. Um, the interpretation of the table uh, follow simply from the heading. Um, the first number uh, refers to the IQ. Um, the, second, the second number is the, the actual GDP uh, in, I think, in 2000 or something like that in these places. And uh, the third number called fitted GDP would be the calculated GDP based on uh, a regression analysis. That is what we should expect the GDP to be uh, uh, given the IQ in, in that country and taking the stable relationship between IQ and uh, GDP into consideration. Um, I do not want to spend uh, much time on, um, on this. The, the countries are ordered here in descending order as far as um, IQ is concerned. On the back side, that continues uh, all the way to 
Zimbabwe. Um, I should um, make one remark about the more underdeveloped countries. In the more underdeveloped countries, the actual GDP uh, tends to be underestimated because in very highly agricultural societies where there is a relatively high degree of self-sufficiency, uh, GDP numbers um, understate, so to speak, the productive output because GDP measures only goods and services that were actually sold and bought in markets. So if you grow your own tomatoes and your own potatoes, uh, that would not be counted. Uh, whereas if you grow potatoes and tomatoes and then sell them on the market, uh, then they would be counted. Obviously, in terms of standard of living, that would make no difference, but in terms of GDP or GNP numbers such as this, um, in one case it would be counted, in, in the other case um, it would not be counted. So the overall impression that you get from this list is those countries that have high IQs um, also have high GDPs. Um, and those countries that have very low IQs have on the average very low GDPs. There are, however, some clear-cut exceptions, obviously, which would have to be ex explained differently. Um, take the case of China, uh, which is uh, here listed with an IQ of uh, 100 um, and has a GDP of uh, $3,000 and uh, a calculated GDP of 16,000. Now here obviously the explanation is that China was and still is to a certain extent a communist country, uh, leading of course to an extremely low uh, actual GDP um, and leading us on the other hand to the conclusion that if this type of system would be abolished, the potential of China uh, is significant. That is, we can expect GDPs of 16,000 per person or something uh, in the neighborhood of that. There are also some countries that seem to be overperforming. Um, the Germans produce a higher GDP than their IQ would indicate, for instance. Um, the same is true for, for the U.S., if I remember correctly. The U.S. has an IQ of 98, um, so this is significantly higher actual GDP uh, than predicted GDP based on, um, based on the intelligence um, of the population, which again we would explain, so to speak, with uh, having a relatively, comparatively speaking, uh, freer market system than, uh, than some other places have. One might object to a table such as this. Doesn't intelligence also have something to do with picking the right economic system? Um, so maybe there is something wrong with the Chinese after all, uh, despite having such a great uh, potential, after all, uh, for a considerable amount of time, they lag behind uh, to such a great um, extent. Um, uh, we can also, again, I do not want to overinterpret this, um, this um, table, but you can also see, for instance, how relatively vain the attempt is, for instance, to expect economic miracles uh, in Africa 
from taking place. If you look at African countries and look at the IQs there, um, you will have a rather dim uh, impression as far as uh, the growth potential uh, of those countries um, are concerned. Um, let me end this uh, discussion, um, and I think the table itself is highly interesting to, uh, to study. Um, let me end this by saying that, of course, IQs are also not what we might call invariable biological constants. Um, they are subject to variation as well, even though it is not as easy to vary them as many other, other things. Um, obviously, we would expect that yeah, uh, the old Babylonians and uh, the old Egyptians must have done somewhat better than the present Babylonians and the present Egyptians, uh, given their relatively low performance nowadays and their glorious achievements um, in the past. Um, the most uh, straightforward way to imagine that these numbers are, of course, subject to influence is just to realize um, that you that populations can of course engage in eugenic breeding practices so to speak um, yeah, you c societies for instance were the upper classes the more intelligent people uh, have it as a habit to have larger numbers of children um, and uh, the lower classes with lower IQs have smaller number of children that would lead over a few generations obviously to an upward lifting of IQs. Um, the same thing of course also applies in reverse. Um, that is, if you would have uh, the lower classes with low IQ levels, so to speak, um, producing the overwhelming bulk of children and um, the upper classes, so to speak, producing uh, very few or none, uh, then one would expect that the average IQ um, over the time span of several uh, generations uh, would fall. Um, hypotheses have been advanced, for instance, for why is it that uh, Jews tend to have a very high IQ, even though Israel here is uh, not particularly um, outstanding with an IQ of 94. Um, but uh, the Jewish population in the United States uh, has an IQ of uh, well above 107 or something like this. Um, partially that can be explained simply by uh, migration. Um, that is, the more successful people are more mobile and go to places where there is more opportunity for them and there is an, a larger concentration of those. For instance, they have done studies where they compare the IQ of Scots who live in London as compared with Scots who remain in Scotland and found that the IQ of Scots in London was significantly higher than Scots who stayed behind in Scotland. Again, that has a rather obvious explanation that is just my, the, the smarter one, so to speak, move to the place. The East German case, East-West German case, is also interesting. They do not break it up here. Germany is simply uh, listed as IQ of 102. Um, but um, uh, I have seen 
uh, comparisons between East Germany and West Germany, and there the difference was that West Germany had one of 104 and East Germany of 98. Um, and again, there exists a very straightforward explanation for a phenomenon such as this. Uh, East Germany was under socialist rule and expropriated, of course, most of the successful individuals, and the most successful individuals left the country. Um, so, of course, that lifted the IQ in West Germany and lowered the IQ uh, in, uh, in East Germany. Um, another explanation that has been advanced, uh, coming back to the case of the Jews, for instance, uh, I tend to be somewhat skeptical about that one, but just for illustrative purposes, I might mention it, um, that the largest numbers of children w were in Orthodox Jewish families typically produced by rabbis. Um, if one assumes that the rabbis, so to speak, were uh, the smartest uh, of the bunch, then you would expect, so to speak, an upward tendency in IQs simply by different type of breeding behaviors. Um, okay, so much about um, uh, about this subject. Uh, clearly, uh, explanations along this line are not sufficient uh, when it comes to explaining the wealth of nations. But I think one would also be blind to the facts uh, if one simply dismisses uh, things like this uh, easily. Um, the evidence that these people, uh, Lin and uh, Van Hanen, present uh, is, is uh, dramatic, overwhelming. Um, you will be uh, you will be shocked to see how easy sometimes the explanation for phenomena is that other people struggle around uh, for decades to not explain. Okay, with this, uh, let me return to my, the topic of this lecture, which is uh, the production of uh, law and order. Um, within a natural order. That is, the production of law and order without a state. Uh, tomorrow I will talk about the origin of the state, but so far we are still considering, so to speak, what would naturally evolve. Just as uh, division of labor naturally evolves, uh, money as a medium of exchange naturally evolves. Uh, capital accumulation um, will take place under um, decently favorable circumstances and not so much under less favorable uh, circumstances. So it can also be expected that every society um, will, of course, develop some mechanisms in order to defend itself uh, against uh, asocial uh, individuals. As long as mankind is what it is, we will have people who engage in productive activities and have never any other desire but to, to be productive individuals. Uh, so long as that is the case, we will also have people uh, who try to hit other people on the head and rob and rape them and so forth. And every society that wants to survive um, will have to do something about it. Um, let me first return briefly to the subject of property and property rights, because what it is <coughs> that we want to defend in a natural order is, of course, property and uh, the rights of people to their property. We have seen that people uh, 
take it even from the very most primitive uh, situation on for granted th that they own themselves due to the direct connection that we have with our physical body. Um, people also never had any doubt that those instruments that they themselves produced were their instruments and nobody else's instruments. When it came to the development of settled agriculture, this idea was expanded to pieces of land. Um, people then began to uh, put up signs in order to claim certain land territories as theirs. Um, and, um, and these signs consisted typically in uh, doing something to the land visibly uh, so that other people could see this is not a piece of uh, uncu uncultivated wilderness. This is a piece of land that has been worked on. Somebody has done something to it, and I can see it. Um, and as you will admit, of course, uh, it is quite easy it, uh, in almost all cases um, to distinguish between a piece of land that has been cultivated in any way by mankind and a piece of wilderness. Just drive through whatever the Rocky Mountains, and you will see that most of the places are completely untouched. Nobody has done anything to these, and you can see it that that is the case. On the other hand, drive through similar mountain ranges in Europe, let's say in Austria and Switzerland, you see that people have indeed cultivated the mountains all the way to the top of the mountain. Um, that is visible for anyone who has eyes to see. Um, and of course, people uh, will show willingness to defend themselves against invaders uh, trying to take these cultivated pieces of land um, away, from, away from them. Um, let me emphasize again why it is that we need norms of property. If goods are scarce, then conflicts over these goods are possible. If we want to avoid conflicts over the use of scarce resources, there exists only one method to do it, and that is to formulate rules of exclusive use regarding scarce resources. That is, formulating rules that say you can do something with it, but you are excluded from it. Uh, as long as all of us have access to the scarce resources, conflicts are unavoidable. So we can say property norms in this sense are uh, natural and necessary institutions in order to avoid conflicts. And the rule of the first one to produce something, the first one to appropriate something, that he becomes the owner and not somebody else, the second one or the third one, or uh, the rest of the mankind sharing in what somebody else has originally appropriated, the naturalness of this rule you can recognize by recognizing that if mankind, so to speak, wants to act without conflicts from the beginning of mankind on, then the rule of the first one to use something becomes the owner of it is the only rule that makes this possible. That is, that mankind can, from the beginning of mankind on, conceivably act without any conflicts. Okay. In this sense, these norms are natural norms. 
or natural laws. No other laws have this advantage of avoiding, of making it possible to avoid conflicts between humans from the very beginning of mankind on. There's only one additional consideration that uh, I want to present when it comes to uh, conflicts over property rights. Um, and that concerns the problem of easements. Um, if I appropriate, oh no, this is the wrong thing here, right? Lou, but Lou is not here. Uh, yeah. This is high technology. <laughs> Could not have happened with PowerPoint. Uh, so if this is my piece of land and I have no neighbor so far. Um, and now I uh, spew out smoke here and here and here and so forth. Um, and after a while, uh, somebody settles next to me. Um, can this person B complain about person A that he causes physical damage to the property of B? And the answer is, no, in this case he can't, because person A has acquired what is called an easement. He was there first, uh, and uh, nobody's property was damaged by his initial activities. If somebody else now comes along B, then what B has appropriated is from the outset soiled or dirty property. Um, and if B wants to have unsoiled or clean property, then B must pay A to stop this. But A being there first has acquired an easement to continue with this activity if he so desires. B must pay A in order to stop it. If the situation is the other way around, that is, B is here first, and then A settles next to B, and then spews out his smoke and whatever it is onto B's property, then the situation is different. Um, B has acquired clean property and he has acquired an easement <coughs> for his property to be left clean. In this case he could take out an injunction against B and tell B you must stop this uh, or you must pay me in order for me to let you continue with this activity. <coughs> These are, so to speak, the elementary rules uh, that have been accepted by mankind uh, for thousands of years. Again, there exist, so to speak, disputes sometimes about who was their first and who was their second. Um, but, uh, but, but those rules uh, were considered to be the basic fundamental rules of dealing with, uh, with conflicts arising over who owns what and who is permitted to, what, to do what and who is not permitted to, to do what. So when we are talking about the production of security in a natural order, I have in mind the defense of these principles. 
um, who has appropriated something first has the right to defend it, um, who was there first without any neighbors acquires an easement if certain negative externalities uh, result um, uh, or if negative externalities come later then the initial owner has the right to stop these uh, negative externalities. Um, now in a natural order um, first thing that I want to point out um, um, that this does not only include of course self-defense. Um, I've already mentioned the fact that uh, insofar as we control something we automatically would defend ourselves against people who try to take control away of things that we ourselves are in control of. Um, we also from the very beginning uh, select the places where we have our property partly, partially uh, with consideration of uh, how easy or difficult are these things to defend where they are. Uh, to just give you examples, for instance. Uh, the location of Venice is somehow in the marshes. Um, but it is difficult for invaders, especially at an age when you had very limited technological uh, abilities, uh, to invade a place like this. Because you have to go through the water and the water is flat and uh, and you don't know your way around it and so forth. It is easier to defend a place like this. So the location of many places was chosen precisely with this idea in mind, is it a place that can be easily defended? Um, of course, if there is nobody around for ten thousands of miles, you are alone, then that might not be an important consideration for you to choose certain locations. But if you are surrounded by other people, then these sorts of considerations are of importance. Um, the same thing is true for uh, the low countries, the Netherlands. Um, they also offer certain possibilities of defending yourself by flooding certain areas uh, and making an invasion of other people very difficult. Um, another example would be the valleys in, in mountain regions. Um, some people settled in, in Swiss valleys, um, very remote valleys in high elevations uh, precisely because they knew that those were places that were comparatively easy to defend and very difficult to occupy. Um, even in modern times this has made a difference. Um, the German, Germans could have probably because of their significantly larger size invaded a country such as Switzerland. But Switzerland had on the one hand uh, uh, a militia with every man being armed and having semi-machine guns at home with ammunition in the um, in the closet. Still remember how impressed my children or when I took him to some of my Swiss friends and then he opened the closet and there was a <laughs> big gun and, and enough ammunition to kill half of the German population. <laughs> um, and also of course because a country like Switzerland because of its mountainous uh, terrain 
Yeah. It's very difficult to, uh, to invade and occupy. You can see that again how our brave soldiers in Afghanistan struggle up and down the mountain to find, uh, to find the people um, that they are looking for. Um, or take a place like San Marino, which uh, sits on top of a thousand, f thousand feet uh, mountain with a big fortress um, around and uh, a population of 8,000 people uh, which made up San Marino uh, were able to defend themselves for 1,500 years from any invasion. Um, now, uh, second, second thing I want to point out is how obvious uh, it is um, in which way in small societies justice will be done. We always hear about the necessity of a state in order to do justice. Again, the world provides us with hundreds of thousands of examples how absolutely ludicrous this idea is. In every little society encompassing a few people, uh, there are very quickly a few people rising to the rank of some sort of authority. They are braver, smarter, uh, more successful, more trusted than others. Um, you can see that in every village. Um, and whenever there is a conflict, that is A steals something from B, or A knocks over B, uh, and they fight over who did it and who didn't do it, um, while it was possible that they engage, so to speak, in vigilante just justice, that is, try to beat the crap out of each other right on the spot, um, in most cases, and for good reasons, they don't do that because it is very difficult then afterwards uh, to justify themselves before the other members in the village. So they turn to people who have more authority than others do, and these people, let's call them nobles or whatever, uh, or aristocrats, or the elite, whatever the term is, it doesn't matter, uh, these people will then act as judge, uh, typically without charging any fee, just out of uh, the responsibility of being a leader of a small community. And based on their judgment and on their authority that they have among their fellow men, uh, this judgment then will be enforced automatically. In most cases, there is not even violence necessary in order to enforce it on the person who was found to be guilty. Um, the person himself will accept it and will be willing to do restitution because otherwise he will be expelled from the community. He will, have, he will be an outcast. And nothing is in those societies worse than being an outcast. Again, even in modern times, this sort of ostracism uh, works magnificently in many professions. Um, I met a main a large grain dealer in Switzerland at some time and they did dealings with grain dealers all over the world and uh, he reported that uh, they had some quarrels with certain qualities of, uh, uh, of grains 
or delay of delivery from some, some grain dealer in the Soviet Union still at the time when the Soviet Union was intact. No regular court was involved, just the association of grain dealers was involved in this. The proceedings took place in the Soviet Union. And the unanimous verdict was the guy in the Soviet Union had done wrong and the judgment was enforced and this person was thrown out of this association of merchant dealers, of grain dealers. Nobody ever dealing in grain would have had anything to do with this person again. Um, mere ostracism was entirely sufficient uh, to do it. Now, of course, you also have sometimes recalcitrant people, um, and those people then get uh, hit on the head, just like we do it nowadays, also with those people who are not willing to listen, and they are, were by and large forced to do compensation to the victim. That was the principle of punishment to do compensation to the victim. You realize, of course, uh, that uh, criminals nowadays do not compensate their victims at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, victims typically have to shell out more money so that uh, recalcitrant uh, criminals can do table tennis, watch TV, engage in workouts, get their rice, the right muesli and whatever it is in, uh, in prison very different situation than, uh, than that that would exist um, in a natural order. Um, but even on this relative primitive level, um, we, we would of course expect that, uh, that there are certain limitations to self-defense that people would want to rely on specialized defense providers. Um, they want to take advantage of division of labor also in this field. Not everybody is equally good at protecting somebody else. Uh, that's why bars usually have big, big time uh, uh, people standing in front of the door and making sure who goes in and uh, doesn't go in, and not teeny old ladies. Um, so yes, division of labor is as important in that area as it is um, in others. Um, and what I want to do now is to describe, so to speak, first how this system of uh, defending oneself against aggressors worked during the feudal age, during the Middle Ages, um, a time when no state existed, uh, just a large number of highly decentralized uh, lords and vassals and so forth. And then in the next step, I will explain with some cues taken from the feudal order how such a system would work in, uh, in modern times. I don't know how far I get, but I'm obviously a little bit behind in my plans here, so I might have to keep you on Saturday as well. <laughs> um, so in these uh, feudal times there uh, existed, so to speak, landlords, owners of pieces of land, and, uh, and they had uh, tenants, tenant farmers. Um, uh, both were contractually connected. Most of the stuff that we learn about feudalism uh, tends to be half-truths at the best. Uh, feudalism has a very bad name, undeservedly bad name. Um, 
And the contract between the landlords and the tenants uh, typically provided for uh, the landlord provides protection uh, and the tenant uh, works for a certain period of time for uh, the landlord and is in cases of conflict also uh, willing and prepared to fight on the side of, um, of the landlord. Um, law, as Joe, uh, Joe Stromberg mentioned in his lecture, law at that time was considered something that was given. Law was not considered to be something that was made by people, but something that existed eternally and that was just simply discovered. Um, people learned what it was. New law was from the very outset considered to be suspicious because law had to be old. It had to be something that had always existed. Anybody who came up with some sort of new thing was automatically dismissed as uh, probably a fraud. Um, the subjects, the tenants, had a right to resist. That is, they were not subject to their lords no matter what. Because, as I said, there existed an act eternally valid law which protected the tenant as much as the landlords and if the landlord did break this law then the tenants had the right to resist up to the point of killing the landlord um, these landlords in turn had been contractually tied to other landlords. The lords had, so to speak, other overlords. Um, and again, these contracts provided by and large for uh, mutual assistance agreements. Uh, if such and such happens, yeah, you will provide so and so many soldiers or peasants to do this, and you do such and such, uh, and so forth. Um, and uh, what came about was called a feudal pyramid. That is, uh, again, another contract with somebody who might be even more powerful, meaning in this case who had even larger land holdings and larger number of tenants and so forth all the way up to the king. Not only that, uh, people frequently had contracts with various lords, with competing lords, so to speak, uh, as some sort of insurance policy. That is, if this guy does something to me, I also have another protector. Um, and in combination with these sorts of multiple alliances that existed, uh, they typically agreed that if it would come to a conflict between their two lords to which they had pledged their allegiance, then they would remain neutral. Um, Peasants who were not associated directly with any particular lord in some sort of protection agreement, who were sort of isolated peasants, uh, usually chose the king as their protector. Uh, there is someone slightly more, more removed, but they also received some sort of legal protection um, by associating them um, with, with the king directly. Um, there existed also so-called 
uh, allodial owners, that is uh, people who were big landowners on their own and had no allegiances uh, to anyone um, and would meet the king, so to speak, on an even, on an even level. Um, they had less land than the king might have had and so forth and less tenants and less soldiers working for them. Um, but they were in dealings with the king, um, his, um, his equals. Um, the lords on their territory uh, had complete jurisdiction over their territory, including over all those people who lived on that territory. That is, they were the judge over their peasants, uh, their warriors, uh, their house personnel, um, and so forth. Um, intervening into the internal affairs of a lord was not permitted. In this sense, they had a similar status that, let's say, embassies have nowadays. That's like, where the United States cannot simply go into the embassy of China and then do whatever they want. Uh, in the Chinese embassy, the Chinese rule themselves. Um, so the lords were in charge of, uh, of, their, uh, of their dominion. And they represented their tenants or vassals uh, in external affairs. Um, the king uh, was typically a person who came from a particularly noble family, a family that was recognized as a family of great achievement, uh, and was always chosen from this family, uh, but was not hereditary in the sense that it was perfectly clear who would become the next king. It was all the other nobles who were contractually all connected with each other who determined unanimously who of the members of this king family should become the king. Um, Eventually, this type of principle that combines, so to speak, hereditary elements with elective elements uh, disappeared and either the hereditary element took over or the pure elective uh, element uh, took over. But in the initial stages, it was a combination of these two uh, elements. The king coming always out of the same family, but who of the family would become the king depended on uh, the result of an election um, among, among the lords. Um, these assemblies of lords that selected the king uh, became in a way the precursors of, oh yeah, of what we consider to be parliaments. Um, but of course, only nobles, that is, landlords themselves, not tenants, um, were in charge of uh, electing, um, electing the king. Um, the king, king's main task consisted in... Uh, with the ag agreement of his assembled nobles uh, to declare uh, cases of emergency, war or something like this. But only with the consent, 
with the unanimous consent of the nobles assembled in this, uh, in this parliament. Um, and in addition, the king had, so to speak, the function of some sort of appeals court. Um, that people who thought that an injustice had been committed against them, including an injustice by their own lord, could appeal to the king uh, for final justice. Um, the early feudal kings uh, traveled around frequently from town to town. They were, so to speak, wandering judges. Uh, there existed no such thing as capitals. Um, in the German uh, case, for instance, um, there were uh, places where regular court sessions were held in uh, in Nuremberg, uh, in Augsburg, in Regensburg, in Frankfurt, in Prague, uh, in Vienna, and several other places. All of these places had, so to speak, uh, an elevated status as places where one could seek justice, but uh, no capital existed. The king could also not tax. Um, this is taxes in the modern sense did not exist. The king lived of his own estate, just as all lords lived of their own estate. All that he could do is, in cases of war, go to his various nobles there and, and beg them, uh, give me a little bit, give me a little bit, or something like this. Uh, whereby every noble was perfectly entitled to say no. And nothing would, uh, would happen to him. Um, the task of the king was also, besides uh, with the agreement of the nobles to uh, decide about cases of war, to establish on the outskirts of these loose association of, uh, of lords and nobles and so forth, uh, so-called uh, uh, protection villages, um, where people were settled, um, uh, selected due to their uh, particular abilities as fighters, in order to protect, let's say, Christendom from the Turks or something like this. Uh, they were called Wehrdörfer, uh, who were fortified, uh, in, uh, especially because um, they had to def their task consisted in, 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 the, in the defense against societies that were considered to be other than the society that was combined or integrated through this intricate system um, of, uh, of feudal uh, contract relationships. Um, not only did the right to resistance exist among the tenants against their landlords, uh, very importantly, it was also possible that these tenants, if they felt oppressed by their landlord, could run away and simply associate and get protection from a neighboring lord, uh, which was, of course, the best protection that you can have, so to speak, from being oppressed in the first place, knowing that all you have to do is run away and attach yourself to some other protector and thereby you get rid of your previous, uh, previous lord. Um, on, this, on this point in particular, um, that is the ability of people to run away 
and attaching themselves to a different uh, uh, protector, um, I want to quote Herbert Spencer, who describes uh, the situation in ancient Rome, which was very similar in its feudal structure uh, as Europe during, um, during the Middle Ages. Um, Herbert Spencer there says, about early Rome. In early Rome, Rome is also a famous place for complete uh, domination, dominion of the house, of the master of the household over his uh, uh, tenants and servants, including his children and wife and so forth. Uh, he writes there, uh, in early Rome, while coercive rule within the family and the group of related families was easy, there was difficulty in extending coercion over many such groups. Fortified as they were, uh, and again these feudal landlords of course all had certain amounts of fortifications, um, fortified as they were against one another. Moreover, the stringency of government within each of the communities, that is each of the clans, constituting the primitive city, was diminished by the facility of escape from one and admission into another. As we have seen among simple tribes, Desertions take place when the rule is harsh. And, and we may infer that in primitive Rome there was a check on exercise of force by the more powerful families in each settlement over the less powerful caused by the fear that migration might weaken the settlement and strengthen an adjacent one. Thus the circumstances were such that when for defense of the city, cooperation became needful, the heads of the clans, included in its several divisions, came to have substantially equal powers. The original Roman Senate was the collective body of clan elders, and this assembly of elders was the ultimate holder of the ruling power. It was an assembly of kings. Um, now, let me emphasize at this point again. Just as important for the successful development of Western Europe, it was that there was a separation between church and state, uh, different from all other regions on the globe. So it was of utmost importance for the dynamic development of Western Europe, that Western Europe was, so to speak, a political anarchy. That is to say, uh, thousands of independent landlord nobles somehow connected together through contracts and so forth, but each being his own man. Uh, and the ease with which people could move from one jurisdiction, so to speak, uh, in another, uh, which tends to contribute, of course, to moderation on the part of each one of these rulers. Each one must be afraid, if I'm too draconic in my punishment of my own men, then they will attach themselves to somebody else and strengthen people who in some situations might become um, my enemy. <coughs> in addition, one more element uh, should be mentioned in order to characterize, so to speak, the feudal um, 
the feudal world. Um, and that is the existence of, uh, of cities. Um, and these cities were typically um, founded either by bishops uh, or by nobles, by lords, uh, or by associations of merchants. And in some cases, of course, also by as in the case of Switzerland, for instance, um, by Eidgenossenschaften. Uh, what would be the appropriate term for that, Joe? Uh, sworn communities? Yeah, sworn bound by oath. Uh, bound by oath or something. Yeah. Um, which, is, which is, so to speak, the structure that the initial uh, founding cantons in Switzerland had where all free men swore an oath that they would come to uh, mutually assist each other in case of an attack um, uh, against, uh, against them. Um, and these uh, cities um, had frequently uh, written law codes that is uh, Magdeburg law or Hamburg law or Hanover law or Lübeck law and so forth so that people who moved to these cities knew what law, co lo law code would apply to them and when new cities were founded uh, the normal thing to do was to adopt one of the already existing law codes and maybe make a few amendments to it. That is, some law codes uh, became the law codes not just of one city but of many, many cities um, who adopted the initial example of some, uh, of some place that uh, uh, that first took the initiative to write these uh, laws down. Um, in this connection, um, a little side remark. Uh, in English-speaking countries, America and England, uh, there is a certain amount of pride in, in having the so-called common law. Uh, which is in a way non-codified law, um, case law. Um, the continental tradition, as you know, uh, has been for a long time different. That is, there we have had codified law uh, taken from uh, from the Romans, uh, especially from the East Romans, who had codified this uh, law for the first time in an extensive uh, manner. Um, and then, of course, uh, in, in modern times, uh, the Code Napoleon, uh, which <coughs> has been taken over by, by most continental European states in one form or another with some modification uh, or another. And as I said, uh, Anglo-Saxons look down on codified law and hail their non-codified common law. Uh, I want to just remark that, for instance, Max Weber uh, has a very <coughs> interesting observation regarding this. He sees uh, uh, the reason for the non-codification of the common law um, in the self-interest of the lawyers to make the law uh, difficult to understand for the layman and thus make a lot of money uh, and emphasizes that codified law of course makes it possible for 
the layman on the street who can read, uh, to study the law book himself, uh, and go to court himself and point out, here, it, this is written down and so forth. Um, so maybe this uh, excessive pride that the Anglo-Saxons have in their common law um, might, be, um, might be a little bit o overdrawn. Um, in terms of uh, punishment, um, as I said, uh, compensation to the victim was the main principle. Um, and there was worked out relatively quickly um, some system of paying fines for various types of offenses. And by and large, they accepted the principle of proportionality. If you killed somebody, then you had to pay more than if you cut off somebody's arm. Uh, if you cut off somebody's arm, uh, the fine that was imposed on you uh, was higher than if you cut off somebody's toe and so forth. But most of the punishments were indeed in the form of fines, either monetary fines or fines in the form of uh, natural uh, natural goods. So now I should come to the modern world and I'm realizing that <laughs> that I'm running somewhat out of time. Um, but let me, yeah, let me just begin at least. Um, now obviously we cannot go back to this uh, feudal system. Um, my purpose was only to show that uh, we do have historical examples where societies have developed relatively effective means of protecting themselves through systems of alliances. Um, in the modern world, um, we would expect, of course, a slightly different setup, and uh, this setup um, would be uh, composed mostly of three institutional devices. Um, on the one hand, uh, commercial insurance companies. Um, on the other hand, uh, freely financed police forces um, and uh, freely financed arbitration and judge judging um, agencies. We can imagine that these three institutions would operate separately from each other but be contractually aligned with the others or we can imagine uh, that these three institutions would be vertically, vertically integrated. That is to say, an insurance company would also have a police division and a judge division uh, attached to it. It doesn't really matter whether it is verti vertically integrated or, are they, uh, or uh, we have uh, uh, independent institutions. Uh, the decisive element here would be, again, that the relationships between all of these institutions would be again contractual, voluntary, uh, similar to the situation that existed during um, the feudal, uh, feudal era. Um, and I want to explain in particular that through such a setup, um, we would gradually create also something like the unification of law. Just as we have the world becomes unified through one money, the world becomes unified through worldwide division of labor, uh, so the world would also become 
integrated uh, through a set of uh, universal standards of, uh, of law. Um, now how would this, uh, how would this happen? Um, I think the main impulse in that direction would come from insurance companies. All institutions in the modern world, all firms, all companies, everybody having an enterprise requires insurance. To operate, so to speak, without insurance is almost impossible in the modern world. You can only be a very small scale entrepreneur and do entirely uh, on your own without having some sort of insurance protection. Um, because of this, it would not be possible, as some people have argued, that there would be, so to speak, that all institutions, all places would lay down their own peculiar rules and laws. That is, the mall has the mall laws, the school has the school laws, the steel factory has the steel factory laws. It, at, at Stringham's house, <laughs> the laws would, would be if somebody comes in there uh, that he has not invited, there might be autom automatic shooting devices that kill the person who comes in and things like this. Um, why would that not be the case? Because insurance companies would of course insist that many of these practices are simply not insurable. Um, they would insist on a certain amount of uniformity of standards uh, that all of these insured uh, companies would have to, uh, have to adopt. Uh, they would eliminate, so to speak, arbitrary rules applying at this place or um, at that place and insist on rather general and generally known rules uh, on the one hand in order to reduce, so to speak, general uncertainty and on the other hand because uh, only if they lay down rather general rules will they be able to attract a large clientele, which is of course um, their desire. Secondly, insurance companies will have an inherent interest, a financial interest in imposing on everyone who is insured by them uh, a defensive behavioral code. Um, the reason for this is you can insure yourself only against risks over whose outcome you have no personal control. Um, you cannot insure yourself, for instance, against the risk that I provoke him and he then smashes me in the face and then I go to my insurance company and say he smashed me in the face and now defend me against him. The insurance company would say look you have to behave in an entirely defensive way the attack must have been entirely unprovoked only then will we defend yourself, but not if you have anything to do with the attack yourself. Uh, I cannot insure myself against the risk of burning down my own house. I can insure myself against the risk that my house burns down. Um, but no insurance company would insure me uh, and allow me to burn down my own house and then make payment for it. Um, so insurance companies will insist uh, in order to cover you for any type of contingency that you have to commit yourself uh, to a fundamentally uh, defensive uh, form of behavior and conduct. 
by their very nature, they want to minimize damage. Um, minimizing damage is, so to speak, the business in which they are in. Otherwise, they would have to pay up. Um, so what we would get is insurance companies might offer a certain variety in the types of contracts um, that they offer. Uh, let's say an insurance company might specialize in Catholic clients um, and, uh, uh, and impose certain types of punishment for uh, whatever, committing adultery that other, uh, other companies would not have in their repertoire. Um, but they cannot be fundamentally different um, in, in the type of codes that they would offer. And moreover, um, because it is now possible that conflicts arise between members of different insurance agencies as slightly different as the contracts of these different insurance companies are, whenever there are conflicts between people being insured by different insurance agencies, the only peaceful resolution that is possible is uh, to go to an independent third arbitrator. Um, and this independent third arbitrator, again, that might be agencies that offer, so to speak, they would be independent of both companies, these independent arbitration agencies, of which there exist, again, competing ones, um, and no arbitration agency can be sure that it will be chosen again uh, uh, in such cases. These independent arbitration agencies have now, obviously, an, an interest in order not to lose their clients, that is, the two conflicting insurance companies, uh, to develop a set of law that can be regarded as acceptable to everyone regardless of what his partic particular or specific insurance company is which would, with which he deals in, in most cases. That is to say, these independent arbitration agencies would create in a process of competition something like a universally valid international law. Um, and thereby, through a process of competition, so then lead to a situation where we have u a unified law structure that is valid, so to speak, uh, throughout the entire world, more or less. Um, and this completes, so to speak, the process of uh, of economic and social integration. Um, integration through division of labor, integration through money, and integration uh, through some international law that binds all societies together, however different their internal law structure might be. This is how I think a natural order would uh, look like roughly um, in the modern world and effectively defend the property rights uh, of individuals. And with this, I have again overdrawn my time and uh, beg for your uh, uh, forgiveness. Um, there will be more time in, um, in the lectures to come, especially in the last one when I talk about strategic uh, um, ideas. So I would ask you, since I'm dried out in the meantime, to hold back with any questions and delay them until the next time. Thank you again.